John LLC v. David Band. Good morning. Gwendolyn Powell Braswell for the appellants, Mr. Libby and Libby St. John. I'd like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. In the trial below, the jury found that David Band, an attorney, breached his fiduciary duty to the Libby parties as clients doing business with their attorney. However, the jury also found in favor of Band's affirmative defensive waiver, and as a result, no damages were awarded. This is the second appeal in this case, and the issue on this appeal is fairly narrow, and that is whether the trial court abused its discretion in denying the Libby parties motion for new trial, where the Libby parties brought a direct breach of fiduciary duty claim for damages arising from the forfeiture of their partnership interest in September of 2007. And the evidence is clear, obvious, and disputable that the manifest weight of the waiver evidence predated the date of the forfeiture. I submitted a supplemental authority last week, the Dinuro case decided by the Third District Court of Appeal that looked at the law of Florida over the last 50 years and did an extensive analysis of derivative versus direct claims, and that case just reaffirmed the principles established here in the Citizens case back in 1965, I believe, that the direct claim requires both a direct injury and a separate and distinct injury, and direct harm and separate and distinct injury. And it also reiterated the fact that you look to the body of the complaint to determine what the nature of the injury is. And in this case, the case was tried on the second amended complaint, and in that, in those allegations in paragraphs 75 and 80, it alleges that the, that the defendants abandoned, at that point, Abel banned the law firm, which subsequently settled, breached the fiduciary duty owed to the Libby parties by failing to disclose the effects of the transactions, overreaching, and placing unreasonable loss. And then in paragraph 80, it says, as a result, the Libby parties have sustained damages in the loss of their respective interests. Their interests were lost in September of 2007. Now, this issue was litigated quite extensively at the, at the proceedings below in the context of this, the affirmative defense based on the statute of limitations. Below, Band argued extensively that the claims were barred because they rose more than two years before the, the complaint was filed in August of 2007. So the whole heart of that argument was whether the claim arose before or after the forfeiture in September of 2007. It was argued to the jury that way. It was the motion of a, subject of a motion for directed verdict. I've taken a look at the jury instructions, and there was no effort in the jury instructions, at least, to try to say the waiver had to occur before or after any given dates. And, and when it was argued to the jury by the lawyers, nobody argued that, that waivers before a certain date wouldn't apply to these damages or anything like that. And in fact, the argument from Mr. Band's side of this was that the waiver was because they knew he wasn't their lawyer and, and that they had an opportunity to get a lawyer and that they signed documents early on without ever reading them, apparently, was the, was the argument made in closing argument, at least. And there's no objection to this argument being something that's outside the evidence or the issues. So I'm struggling with why the jury's verdict is contrary to the manifest way, why no reasonable judge could, could so rule. Well, because the jury in the, the statute of limitations argument rejected the argument that the claim didn't arise before 2007. It wasn't directly argued in the context of the waiver, to be sure. It was directly presented to the court and preserved at the post-trial motion for judgment, notwithstanding the verdict, and motion for new trial. At that point, during the post-trial hearing, there, the plaintiff's counsel did argue that there could have been no waiver because the evidence of waiver predated the forfeiture. So it was preserved then, and then post the first appeal here on remand, it was put in writing again, this issue, and it was presented to the trial court. And so, because it's the complaint that controls here, the injury that was alleged and the damages that were sought was based on that forfeiture. That was the, the election that was made of, of, as to the damages. And here, 
there is no evidence in, in the um, appellees did not could really contest that all of the evidence of waiver predated the forfeiture. So it's really examining that. Um, the direct claim was was presented. Uh, it was never challenged below as a part of a motion for uh, dismiss or anything else. And we're, we're settled with that. And we're settled with the fact that there was a separate and distinct injury as a result of that. And that is a separate and distinct injury before the forfeiture any harm that had resulted from Ban's acts of breach of fiduciary duty, because the jury did find that he breached his fiduciary duty. So his actions in, 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 uh, in furtherance of the breach occurred before the forfeiture, but our uh, injury of harm was after. And the reason we did that is because we didn't bring a derivative claim here. The derivative claim would have had to require as a necessary party Bay Isles entity, and that was not the claim that was brought. Uh, the claim that was brought here was always a direct claim. It was always based on the separate distinct injury, and that separate and distinct injury was identified in the complaint as the forfeiture. I, and, I, I haven't seen the verdict form in this case. I'm, I'm assuming it's some form of an interrogatory verdict form. What, what all did the jury answer or not answer on the verdict form? It was a, a general verdict form. It was not a special interrogatory on the waiver. General? It was general. The, the <laughs> question was the waived. Uh, whether he not the, the claim was waived, and they checked yes. It was a yes or no answer. Was that the only issue presented to them? Well, there was the, also the issue of whether they breached its fiduciary duty, and there was so general, general verdict form. General verdict oh, form. Yes. Is we find in favor of the defendant, right. So right. Right. We all. There were no special interrogatories as to each count, and it, there, for instance, there is no finding specifically. As to in what manner the breach of fiduciary duty occurred, it was just a finding that there was a breach, and there was finding that there was a waiver, and then the issues were greater fleshed out in the post-trial uh, hearings and on remand. The evidence of waiver that in the record uh, is clear that it all predates it. The uh, Appellees talk about having signed and received the partnership agreements and the conflict waiver letters. That all occurred in 2001 and 2002. Talked about having paid capital call payments, and that all occurred in 2006. And the last one is April of 2007. The last trip to the site was in May of 2007. And the last partnership meeting uh, that Mr. Libby attended was in June of 2007. Once the Libbies uh, went to the site in May of 2007, at that point they saw the true status of the site. And there was a capital call made at the June meeting. But having visited the site, the Libby parties refused to make any further additional capital calls. They did nothing to, at that point to, uh, to indicate any waiver. Once they saw the condition of the site in May of 2007, uh, that was the end of their involvement, and they actually refused to make the, the capital call payment in June of 2007 and made no capital call payments after that point. The uh, law is clear, uh, the Winans case, Weber case, and, and all the other cases in Florida, that an essential element of waiver is that the claim must be in existence at the time of the waiving. And here, because the claim wasn't in existence, because the damages hadn't occurred, uh, we are arguing that there could be no waiver. And the other part of this, of course, is that the claim cannot be brought until the damages are, uh, have occurred. And this is the theory that the plaintiffs went under, that the damages was the forfeiture that was unchallenged. The evidence is all after that. And um, they cannot, it cannot then be waived by the evidence at trial. Anything that was waived would have been a derivative action. So to the extent that there was waiver evidence, and in the first appeal we, we talked about the comp substantial evidence for that. We're not arguing that here. We're, we're acknowledging, for the, as we must for the purposes of this appeal, that there was some evidence, but the waiver of that evidence was on any claim that would have arisen prior to the forfeiture. And there really is no dispute of any, uh, that there is any evidence indicating a waiver after the forfeiture. So if the court doesn't have any further questions, I'd like to reserve the remainder. Good morning, may it please the court. Steve Hutton from Sarasota, representing defendant Appali, David Band. 
Uh, let me cut right to the issue here. I, I have had to, as I handled this case below and on the first appeal, start with the premise of what did they sue for, what were the claims, because those tend to get lost in some of the arguments. They did not sue Mr. Band as a managing member of the entity, which he was. They did not sue Mr. Band as the attorney for the entity, which he was. The claim was that Mr. Libby had a pre-existing individual, personal, attorney-client relationship with Mr. Band before he got into this particular investment, and that as a result of that personal relationship, an attorney doing business with a client has certain duties and obligations. And the argument always was that Mr. Band had breached those duties and obligations by not fully and adequately explaining the deal in writing in a manner reasonably understandable to Libby. Specifically, they said, by way of example, we were never told there were capital calls or would be capital calls, or, or alternatively, we were told there would be no capital calls. And at trial, it was argued that the second Mr. Libby put his money in, the original $140,000, without having these documents, this explanation, et cetera, that was the breach. That was the breach of fiduciary duty. And that has been the position of Mr. Libby un until fairly recently. And now they are trying to argue to this court that, well, that may have been the breach, but we didn't have a cause of action until the forfeiture. The problem with that argument, quite simply, is when you look at what their specific claims were, for example, the representation or the lack of disclosure, supposedly, about capital calls, the first time there is a capital call made, you know at that point you've been told something incorrect or you haven't been given the full story. So you're in a deal at that point that is different from what you believe you are in. So, of course, you've been damaged at that point. And the next time there's a capital call, again, if you really believed that your theory of the case was we were not supposed to make capital calls, when there's a capital call, you say, I quit. You can't keep making these capital calls because that's inconsistent with what you told me. So the idea that seven years later, after multiple capital calls, after Mr. Libby has received and read two conflict waiver letters, after he's been to the project three or four times, consulted his own attorney, been to all kinds of meetings, talked to the construction managers, that seven years later, at that point, he refuses to make a capital call and he's forfeited, that that's when the cause of action accrues, just doesn't make sense in context of what was pled and argued below. Even if you took this argument that somehow the precipitating event that makes the cause of action viable is the forfeiture of Mr. Libby's interest in the entity, there can still be a waiver of the claim prior to that. Libby cites to this court Winans v. Weber on waiver. All it says is the elements that must be established to prove waiver are the existence at the time of the waiver of a right, privilege, or advantage, not a fully accrued cause of action. The right, privilege, or advantage that existed at the time, even if you accept their theory of the first capital call, is the right to say you have breached your duty to me by not telling me fully what the deal was all about or alternatively telling me we would not have capital calls. Clearly they waived that by going forward not once but multiple times with making capital calls. Unless you have any questions of me, I will rely on my brief for the remaining points. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Braswell. I would invite the court to look at the allegations of the complaint. That's why we're here. The complaint alleged the damages as the forfeiture. To the extent there were any other damages arriving before the forfeiture, those were not a part of the case. That was not a part of the damages theory. Any claims before the forfeiture would have been derivative because all of the limited partners here made the capital calls. That would have comprised the separate and unique injury that's required to bring a direct claim. Even Ban himself made the capital calls. This claim was never brought as a derivative claim. It was brought as a direct action, which was never challenged below. The partnership agreements that were given were given to all the partners. The conflict waiver letters that were given were given to all the partners. The capital calls to all the partners. All the partners attended the same partnership meetings. 
So any claim that would have existed before the forfeiture would have been common to all the limited partners and would have been a derivative claim. And that was not the claim that was brought. And so what we have here is um, the situation where we, at the very beginning, pled a direct claim, pled our damages theory. That was never uh, challenged. And we have no evidence at trial of waiver after that. The uh, right and claim and privilege, they bring up the, 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 Winans, the Winans case. The Winans case is just a damages case that set out the elements. And uh, there was no right to bring a claim. Uh, there was the, the jury found that the claim was waived. If there was no right to bring it before it came into existence, then it could not have been waived. So the issue here really is looking at the complaint, looking at how the case was brought, uh, if there were damages before, the Libby parties elected to waive them. That's not their damages theory. That's not the case they brought. So we ask that you, the uh, court uh, would reverse the trial court's ruling denying the motion for summary, uh, for a uh, new trial and uh, remand for further proceedings. Thank you. Thank you. Next case is Rabia versus Board of Trustees of the City Pension Fund.